Welcome back, everybody, to the Advanced Thyroid Series. I'm your host, Karen Martell. And today I have a very special guest, special to me in my own healing journey with hypothyroidism. I'd have to say there's a, a few really key players that came into my life that have been instrumental in my own healing. And first and foremost is, of course, my good friend, Elle Russ. And if it wasn't for her, I would not be where I am right now. And when I was diagnosed with a reverse T3 problem, not really diagnosed, suspected that T3 problem from my own suspicion and Elle's suspicion, she recommended right off the bat, she said, you have to read Recovering with T3 by Paul Robinson. She said, go on, go get his book right now. You have to get it, read it. And that took me over to Paul Robinson's site, Recovering with T3. I ordered two of his books online, um, Recovering with T3 and the CT, or, and the Thyroid Patients Manual, which we'll get into. And and then I actually decided to make an appointment with him because his information was unlike anything that I actually found out there in all of my research on the internet. And it was so profound. And I just thought, I got to meet this guy. I got to talk to him about my own stuff. And since then, he's really, really been super, as I said, instrumental in my own journey. So I've asked him to come on and speak with us today about his story and just his methods. So Paul Robinson is a thyroid patient who became ill with hypothyroidism in his late 20s. He was eventually able to recover using T3 replacement therapy. He is now 60, looks much younger, has written three books, Recovering with T3, the CT3M Handbook, and the Thyroid Patients Manual, and has accumulated a wealth of knowledge on thyroid and adrenal dysfunction. You can find out about his books on his website, recoveringwitht3.com. Paul's most recent book, The Thyroid Patients Manual, covers all types of thyroid medications, T4, T4, T3, NDT, and T3, and includes recent research findings. It will help any patient with suspected or diagnosed thyroid disease or if their treatment isn't working. So welcome, Paul Robinson. Thanks, Karen. Thanks for having me on the show. Appreciate it. Yes. Well, I appreciate you coming on my show and bringing your knowledge to all of these women that are listening today that are suffering with their thyroid, which is many. So let's start first, Paul. You have a, a, an incredible story, really. And I, you know, I think about what I've been through in the last year with my own journey. And I think, oh my gosh, you started this so you're six, you started this in your late twenties. So we'll say 30 years ago. And I, I think, oh my gosh, if I had this much problems now in 2019, what the heck were you going through 30 years ago trying to navigate this? Yeah, well, it's, it's, it's been a long time. It's been a long journey. 30 years is a long time. It's, um, yeah, it was pretty tough at the time. I, I was um, a young guy, 28, 29 in a fantastic career, really loved it. I loved it so much that, you know, if I woke up early at four or five o'clock in the morning, I'd get in the car and go to work and I'd be the first in the door, past the security guys and got the lights on in the office and I was full of energy, I felt great. And then I didn't feel so great for a while. Like things crept up on me, I got a bit slower, a bit more fatigued. Um, I stopped remembering people's names, believe it or not, even people in my own family. Wow. <laughs> that got pretty tough in work. Um, and um, I knew something wasn't quite right, but I, kind of, I had a really great job, a busy, pressurized job. I put it down to stress, you know, as people do, because hypothyroid yeah. creeps up on you really, really, really slowly. And um, yeah, I, I, you know, I just, didn't really realize what was going on. I didn't even know what a thyroid was at that point, <laughs> you know? And then one day I took my pulse, my, you know, um, my pulse and, and basically it was 42 beats per minute. <gasps> and I, I thought, I'm a normally 78, 80, this isn't right. So then I made a list of all the things that weren't quite right with me, you know, weight gain, couldn't remember things, much more tired, need to sleep a lot etc 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 and I thought mm, okay I'm gonna to go to my family doctor 
And so she took a, she did a load of blood tests and then, uh, and she didn't, she didn't wait for me to come back. She actually ran me up and said, I'm coming round. He said, your results are so clear cut and so bad. You're off work for two weeks. Um, and she came over and said, um, yeah, you've definitely got Hashimoto's thyroiditis. What the heck was that? I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, yeah, she said, your TSH, she explained what that was. She said, that's over 50. You're wow. three and three to four. We're almost, almost zero. Uh, you have high antibody levels. Basically, I'm surprised you can function at all. So you're going to take this little tablet and you're going to be fine. <laughs> you're going to take the magic pill and everything's going to be okay. It's called Synthroid, right? Levothyroxine over here. They call it Synthroid where you are. Yeah, you're just going to be fine. I thought, great. I'm going to get my life back. Oh my gosh. How many millions of people have thought that when they went into their doctors and were diagnosed with thyro hypothyroidism or Hashimoto? Yes, I get the magic pill. Everything's going to, the weight's going to fall off. <laughs> You know, they found the answer. It was clear cut. I'm going to take the pill and oh, great. I had the best two weeks of treatment on levothyroxine. I had 25 micrograms, the best two weeks I ever had in seven years. Mm -hmm. And there's a really good reason for that, which is very technical. And I'm not going to bore everybody with that right now. But I felt great for two weeks and then I went, Bleh. I crashed big time. And then from then on, during the next part of that seven years, I just got more and more sick as they changed the dosage, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, I mean, there's a lot that happened during that time and some of it was pretty bad. Um, but yeah, I, um, I saw about six endocrinologists during the whole period and, um, you know, I had all sorts of stupid answers from them. They got all my labs back to normal what they called normal. Um, oh, so the, you, all your T, like your T4, T, did your actual antibodies go down too? No, they never really, it came down eventually, but that's years later. They came down when I was on T3 actually, but um, um, they didn't come down straight away. But basically my labs were considered by them to be normal. And I was told multiple stupid things. Oh, your labs are normal. Therefore your thyroid hormones are treated. Mm. Yeah, and you were diagnosed with like chronic fatigue syndrome and... Syndrome, ME, um, I was asked to join an ME support group because the patients will make me feel better by being there. You know, I can, I, can, I can just get support from them and, and get used to living with this condition, right? So meanwhile, my career is going down the pan and I'm having it. I can't function at home. I can't, I've got the energy to go upstairs. I started to develop low cortisol issues. So my normal weight was about 170 pounds. And I went down to 110, wow. which is a loss of 35% of my body weight with low cortisol. I was passing out practically every day out cold. I mean, not just faint, not just feeling weak, but absolutely blacking out with low blood pressure. And, and all I got from the endocrinologist was, well, we can't do anymore. Your labs look okay. They're fine. And I said to them, but I've still got all the symptoms pretty much. And I lost some of the, obviously lost a lot of the weight because of the cortisol issues, but I've got most of the other symptoms I had to start with. I've got terrible fatigue. I can't function. I can't do my job. I'm going to lose my job. It looks like I can't do the job anymore. And um, cause I'd already started to work fewer hours and part-time and then I had periods where I was in and out of work and I said I've got all the symptoms I had to start with what how do you explain that they said well something else must be causing it now and now I'm thinking um okay so I had these symptoms to start with I never had anything before I was fine I was fit I I never I never had these symptoms before and then I had the symptoms from clearly Hashimoto's thyroiditis and now you're saying, I'm treated, and yet I have the same symptoms. So something else has come in, some other disease has come in, and it's mimicking all those symptoms. Seriously, do you expect me to believe that? And yeah, they did. And they said, well, we don't know what it is. It's some other thing. And I said, okay, we'll find it. No, they weren't interested in doing that. No. They said the labs were normal, and that was it. And that's when I basically gave up with them. I think that was about three or four years in. And then I, I, well, I bought endocrinology books basically and started learning. Which is just, yeah. I mean, I think, what if I hadn't had you? What if I hadn't had Elle? I mean, very similar thing. You know, I 
I finally discovered that my T3 was low. So I didn't have Hashimoto's, but T4, TSH, totally normal. Had been checked for years. Finally, I get T3 checked and it's rock bottom. Felt great like you did for the first couple of weeks on my desiccated thyroid from my naturopath. Crashed. And then finally found a dose that was working, was felt feeling the best I had in 10 years for a good like four or five months. And then suddenly I had worse symptoms than when I started. And the same as you, I couldn't get off the couch. I wasn't passing out like you were, but I very depressed, couldn't get off the couch, rapid weight gain. Yeah, see, that's not fair. You get the you get the weight loss. I got the weight gain with the cortisol problems. You know, and my labs looked amazing. My T3 was over range and I was not hyper. I was the farthest thing from it. You know, T4 was in good range, TSH was low. And my doctor was like, oh, you're on too much thyroid medication. You need to just lower that. And I was like, no, there is something wrong. So, (laughs) and I, I, you know, I just want to mention too, because I know that you've had this, you know, with your own story and people can read your book and really get a better idea of exactly the ripple effect, but the ripple effect of what actually goes on when you suffer with an undiagnosed or undertreated hypothyroidism. It's not just you physically falling apart, but the ripple effect of what actually happens in our external life to the people around us. How do our kids suffer? I know my kids have, like I was, I had chronic migraines from thyroid, you know, and you get tired and depressed and it, it's not just us, is it? No, it's massive massive effect yeah i still get i still get emotional about it yep yeah um, it's a huge effect um well it, it caused me to lose my career yeah which was a big loss because i loved it but also it was a big financial worry because i was frightened about my family and how they were going to survive um i thought i was going to die it was that bad so i started to put a lot of effort into working out how I'm going to make them financially secure when I die, because I thought I would. Wow. I never thought I'd live past, you know, 40, 45. Honestly, didn't. Um, it damages relationships. Yes. And, you know, uh, partners, um, you know, even family. It can damage a lot of things. So the consequences of, of something which is so easily treated, being not treated, it's huge, and to be honest, the doctors don't seem to be uh, don't seem to take that into account. They seem to be so narrow in what they do. The, nar- the, the treatment approach is too narrow, and the research bears that out now for sure. So that's why at that point I decided there was no internet for me, right. so I couldn't find an L. Russ. Right. I couldn't find books really. There were no real good books at that point. There were no internet, internet forums. So I had to just buy the endocrinology books that the endocrinologists used when they were doing their training. And that's what I did. I spent probably the best part of 18 months reading them. And then I concluded that basically my free T3 levels might be in range, but they have changed. They probably were higher. And I determined at that point to, to test this by getting extra T3 with my T4 medication to experiment with it. In fact, I went back to one of the last endocrinologists I had to start with and said, this is what I think's happened. He said, no, you don't need more T3. Your T3 T3 is in range. So I had the same old, same old answer. But that's what I did. And that's how I found out eventually, having tried NDT and T4, T3 from a private doctor and even HC, hydrocortisone with it, that eventually I found out that I needed T3 on its own with nothing else. Right. And can you explain a little bit about what ha- kind of why why is it that we need T3 only? Well, most people don't. Mm-hmm. Okay. Most people don't need T3 only, but T3 itself is the biological, biologically active thyroid hormone. It's the one that acts within the, the nucleus, the center of our cells, which does all the, the real work. And Tyroxin, T4, synthroid, does a little bit of work at the cell membrane, but most of its job is to be converted to T3. And if that conversion process isn't working right, 
or there are other issues, then the T3 won't be at a high enough level within the cell to make the cells work properly. And then you can remain hypothyroid, even though you've got an FT3 level, which appears to be in the range. So you need enough T3. Some of us have serious issues with conversion and other issues that mean that we need a lot more. And some of us extreme cases need T3 on its own um, to make everything work right as it used to work. And what are the number one causes of that conversion problem from T4 to T3? Wow. Okay, the first, this is the top couple. <laughs> Why did you need it? Why did I need it? Well, I turn out to have, um, I found out now that I, 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 found, I turn out to have two gene defects uh, that affect, affect the enzymes that are used to convert T4 to T3. There are two enzymes, one's called D1, one's called D2, and they're made within the cells and they're used to convert T4 to T3. If someone has a defect in the gene, in a gene that affects the production of those enzymes, the enzymes end up being of bad quality. So the conversion rate isn't as good as it should have been. In my case, I have, my mum and dad were really super kind to me. They gave me a, each copy of each defect. <laughs> Both sets of gene defects, of DIO1 and DIO2. And so, and they almost certainly, almost usually kick in around age 30 plus or minus five years. That's the typical thing. Some people have them and they don't seem to manifest themselves, right? Mm. The geneticists still don't understand it. But for those that do manifest, it basically makes conversion dreadful. So your FT3 level would have shifted from where it used to be to a bad situation. Not only that, I had Hashimoto's thyroiditis. Mm -hmm. When you lose thyroid function, when you lose thyroid tissue, which I, mine's gone now completely. When you lose thyroid tissue, you lose about 25% of your T3 ability, your ability to make T3. Most of that is from conversion because the thyroid gland, it, the most important function of the thyroid gland is not making thyroid hormones. It's actually it's like a little machine that sits in the bloodstream and it converts T4 to T3. Most of that 25% of T3 that we get is from the little, is from the conversion of this thing here. Um, it's not the liver mostly, it's mostly the thyroid gland. So when you have thyroid destruction from Hashimoto's or someone in the extreme case has a thyroidectomy, right. then they lose a chunk of their T3 just like that. Right. And the sad thing is that most of the thyroidectomy patients get put on Synthroid, yeah. which is crazy because they're, they're yeah. immediately at a disadvantage. They're not going to have the FT3 level they used to have. Yeah. And the other, the other sad thing is that Young people, say when they're age 18, don't automatically get tested for FT3 and FT4. So when they do get sick, the doctor can say, oh, you're in range. Whereas actually their FT3 level may well have slipped from where it was. Yeah. And because for some people like myself who didn't have, I don't have any antibodies. Um, and my TSH was like yours was high. Mine was really normal. So mm -hmm. that's, that's, that's more indicative than that. It's not an, uh, an autoimmune condition. Is that right? Yes. Like it, because it's going to be, so people that come up with this normal TSH level, that doesn't, that doesn't indicate whether or not there's an issue. Does there? No, no. no. There, there yeah. are other things, lots of other, I mean, we're going to find out in the next 20 or 30 years, countless other reasons. There are going to be countless other gene issues that, that cause problems with receptor uptake and all kinds of stuff. Yeah. So, um, you know, we're, we're, we're the infancy of this, this game at the moment, which is to find out what happens. All we can say is that some people appear to not get well on T4. And when T3 is introduced, you can see improvement. You have to go by the patient response. And that's where a lot of current treatment is, is failing uh, us failing yeah. Um, yeah and so when it came to you and so many others we're seeing this correlation between cortisol levels and thyroid and i know that a lot of functional medicine practitioners say we're not going to give you any thyroid medication we're going to deal with cortisol first because that may fix the thyroid 
And then there's other people that say, no, you have to fix the thyroid to fix the cortisol. And it goes, you get these mixed opinions. And in your case, you were passing out. Like you said, like you're, you had really low cortisol, you're passing out. Um, and this was directly correlated, wasn't it, with your T3 levels? Yeah, it was. Um, um, yeah, I mean, I'm, even when I was given T3, it still took me three years to get well. And uh, I, I asked for a, what we call over here a synacthen test. Over there, you call it an ACTH stimulation test. It's a test that tests for Addison's disease. And uh, I passed that with flying colors. It was fantastic. No. So my adrenals were fine. And the endocrinologist said, there's nothing wrong with your adrenals. Don't talk to us about cortisol anymore. But I said, I've got this cortisol test from the morning when they, they took, took an early morning cortisol test. And it was quite low. Uh, how do you account for that? I said, no, well, it's, it, it's fine. We've just done the the, the acting test. So I went to my GP when I was still feeling dreadful. I was on T3. I felt, I felt much better immediately. I got my mind back straight away on T3. And my, my tummy problems, my gut problems went away. But I was still desperately fatigued. And I still had problems with low blood pressure. So you know very well that cortisol can cause that kind of thing. And um, so I went to my GP and said, can we please do a 24-hour urinary cortisol collection, which at that point gave us free cortisol over 24 hours and total cortisol over 24 hours. A saliva test did not exist in those days, right? <laughs> so, there we go. And she said, yes, fine, because she was, she was really supportive. And um, we did it, and mine was almost just about on the lowest point of the reference range of free cortisol and total cortisol. So it confirmed that it was cortisol, regardless of the synaptin test. And yet I passed the synaptin test, so I knew my adrenals themselves, when they're stimulated with ACTH from the injection okay. they give you. I knew that the adrenals were fine, they just decided to not bother to work for some reason most of the time. And that's what I struggled with. I struggled with during that three-year period on T3, trying to work out why that was. And I kept reading endocrinology books, and I was looking at the circadian rhythms of T4 and T3 and TSH, and looking at how cortisol is produced, because cortisol ramps up in the early hours of the morning, so you're ready to go to work, fired up. But I still couldn't figure it out. And then one night I went to bed, went to sleep and woke up about three o'clock in the morning. I went, aha. Eureka. <laughs> I've got it. <laughs> they actually say, I remember listening to Wayne Dyer once saying that the, the moments that you're most connected. So you, some people will say most connected to God, spirit, whatever energy, universe, it happens in the th between 3 and 4 a.m. He used to get up and write. Do you know Wayne Dyer? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, he's, he's, he was fantastic. But he used to get up and write at that hour because he did his best work and he said it would come through him. He didn't know where it was coming from. He'd just sit down and he'd just write because everything was just downloading into his brain at 3 a.m. And I, so I don't doubt that it came to you at 3 a.m. <laughs> I a lot of things together. I woke up. I had it. I had it in my head. I woke up and I thought, okay. Um, we know, because I knew from the research already, that the pituitary gland makes ACTH, which stimulates the, the, the adrenal glands to make cortisol and DHEA. I knew that. I knew the pituitary had the highest amount of T3 in its cells in the body out of all the other body tissues. So it, it runs on T3 like a little machine that needs T3 to run. And I knew on thyroid treatment, we all take our thyroid meds in the daytime, most of us. And um, I thought T3 is liable to be low for me. But then I looked at the circadian rhythms again of T3 and T4 and TSH. And I could see the pattern. I could see T3, FT3 ramps up in the night around about the same time the cortisol starts to ramp up. And I thought, hmm, pituitary needs T3. T3 ramps in the night. Cortisol ramps in the, in the night. Maybe that's the problem. So the very next 24-hour period, I took some T3 as a nighttime dose. Wow. Oh. <laughs> Blew my mind. Seriously, it was just... just <laughs> what time did you take it the first time? I took it about four or something. I just okay. picked it randomly and 
pick 4 a.m. You know, I took a tablet and went back to sleep. And when I just got up and I felt like a different human being straight away. Can you explain what was, ha- what ha- what was happening? Yeah, well, yeah, I can. I mean, I was given my pituitary system extra T3 that it didn't have because it had dropped low by that stage. The pituitary was thinking, well, got a bit of energy here now. I can make ACTH and I'll just do my best with what you're giving me. And, and lo and behold, it stimulates the adrenals. The adrenals said, wow, last someone's asking me to do it to work. And so they started to work and I got cortisol. And I felt with a T3, I was already taking the daytime and with the extra cortisol, it was fantastic. It was unbelievable by comparison. I had a long way to go to perfect it. And I had a lot more testing to do because I asked my GP, I went back to it as quickly as I could. I I practically ran there. I said, what we've got to do, I've got to do more tests. I need the same test again. I need to take my first dose of T3 when I get up and then half an hour earlier and then an hour earlier and keep doing tests every time and do tests and and keep doing tests with different times. And I did it. She said, yes, fine. It comes to cost a fair bit of money because it's quite an expensive test. And it took us about six months to do the testing because, you, you know, it's, uh, you have to take a little bit of time in between when you're, when you're adjusting the dose. But every time I took the dose earlier, my cortisol got higher. It was like a, it was like a straight line. Yeah. So, um, and I knew that was what was going on. I knew I found something, something really important for me. However, I thought I was the only person in the world <laughs> with this problem. <laughs> this is you, just you, nobody else. <laughs> right. Yeah, the very few I thought there's probably only about three people in the world that need T3. Yeah. And I don't think nobody, I don't think anybody else will want this sort of method. <laughs> and then what, Paul? And then what did, <laughs> how did you realize, oh, maybe I actually better share this information? Well, actually, I probably wouldn't have done that. My, my, my family doctor said, write something, write a paper, write a medical paper about it. Oh, I'm sure people would be really interested. This is a great, you've done fantastic work here. The endocrinologist couldn't fix you. You fixed yourself when I got the dose right. I already lost my job by that stage, by the way. But um, So she said, write a paper. So I tried to write a paper, and I'm such a terrible, at those days, I'm still not very good writer. But at those days, I'm such a terrible writer but I couldn't keep anything succinct. And so I tried to write this, you know, 10 page report for a journal. It ended up being like 80 pages and it was too long. And I thought, this is gonna be so much easier for me to write a book. Yeah, (laughs) exactly, yeah. I gotta get this out. (laughs) I can't bring this down into a two page report. I still thought it was just an interesting story about me and how it worked for me. I didn't dream that what I'd learned would be so useful for other people. Because I had worked out a really, it took me three years to work the protocol out, but so using T3 is not easy. It is hard. It's not like you can go to a doctor once every month and have a blood test and they'll tell you what to do because you can't use blood tests to manage T3 treatment. You have to use a completely different method, which is much more subtle. It took me a long time to work it out. Anyway, I put it into a book thinking that it was still not going to be that applicable to many people. And yet it is, isn't it? Like mm-hmm. it's in comparison to, like you said, very few people with hypothyroidism need straight T3, but when, but when, as a percentage, but that percentage is still probably millions of people, is it not? A lot. Or a, a lot? lot? It's a lot of people, yeah. Uh, it's, it's not, it's, it's a small percentage out of, people that need either T4 and there's no denying that some people do get well with T4 it's fine it's great when they do but then all the others that don't get well on T4 are on the scrap heap basically and sometimes they get well with NDT sometimes they get well with T4 T3 and and rarely do they get off of T3 even when those other treatments don't work but yeah T3 is needed by it, probably millions of people yes yeah, so percentage. You're right. Yeah, and I think that I think, and this is why I kind of wanted to do this series was I really wanted to talk to the people that were like me, and maybe we're a minority, but we're still millions of people that 
or suffering with no one to help us, no one to guide us in this journey. And like you said, if anything it, that I've realized and that you've realized is it is a extremely delicate situation. Like, and each person is so individualized about how it's not here, here, slap on your T3, we'll catch you later, you know, and for most people, the, even the T4, T3, it's, I was thinking like, woohoo, I'm on my desiccated thyroid, everything's great, I'm going to be like this for the rest of my life, and I was just, you know, crossing my fingers, and then it was like, oh, it's not that easy, is it? And now I've had to like undo the layers trying to figure out where is this stemming from, you know, and it's delicate, super delicate situation that need, takes time. It takes time. It's, you got to be patient. <laughs> takes time, but it also needs to be very, very individualized. And it's not the kind of um, production line. Let's look at your labs. Your labs are there. That's fine go out the door it's not like that it has to be patient centric very individualized and it needs to be vet the, the people that are doing the treatment the doctors and endocrinologists need to know more about the research that's out there because things have changed a lot and they're still in the old paradigm most of them of we think t4 works for everybody all we need to do is either track tsh or at best tsh and have t4 and once they're okay, you're treated. And that is just a broken paradigm. It is just so broken, it's not true. My MD, she has a reverse T3 issue. So she herself was on T3 only medication. And when I was in there talking to her about when I was in the beginning stages, she said she gets in trouble by the medical board for prescribing T3 only. She said she'll get a little bit of, you know, flack from her coworkers that it's like, oh, why are you only, why does, why is this person only on T3? And she actually said, I think there could become a time where they don't allow us to prescribe T3 only. And I'm like, well, what? <laughs> and it's yeah. the truth. And even in Canada right now, there's a, a massive shortage because they just don't produce it the same way that they produce Synthroid. Yeah. 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 It's happening in the UK. There are areas in the UK that, um, that won't prescribe T3. Yeah. That's, so, that's it's, crazy. It's beyond stupid. It you is tell you how stupid it is i mean it's and it doesn't the research doesn't bear it out but i think these people are so out of date with the research that's happened in the last 10 years i mean there's a lot of good stuff happened and i know with it. so since your book i'm guessing has come out and has reached a lot of people you can you know if you go on to one of the, the most popular websites stop the thyroid madness um, in, in there, she even states how many of her followers and just the people that have written in to stop the thyroid madness have recovered by using your CT3, what is it? The CTM3 method, <laughs> circadian <laughs> method. T3 method. Yes. She states that many, many, many women, a large percentage that are suffering with reverse T3 stuff and adrenal stuff have really been helped by that method. She said not every, but she says not everyone. So once again, individualized, but large portion of people react very, very well to it. I know it was like, I was kind of like Paul where when he told me to start doing this, it was kind of an instantaneous my cortisol got better and things started to feel better. Like within the week, I was like, really, does this have, is this really working this well? And it was, and my temperature stabilized and all these th great things that I've been waiting to happen when I was, and I didn't change my dose. It was just simply the moving the clock back that w helped to initiate that cortisol. Um, so now that you've, now you know, <laughs> Paul, that so many people can be helped by this, right? So what is happening with the cortisol in the sense of a lot of people think that we need cortaf or adrenal cortex in order to 
get that thyroid working again, that we need it to get into the cells. And that was kind of a misconception that I had thought too, from everything that I'd seen online about, oh, I need to up my Cortef, my cortisol. Um, Cortef is um, a prescription form of cortisol. Uh, and, or you can get adrenal cortex, same idea. It's coming from an animal then, but it's replacing your own cortisol levels. And the idea that you read out there a lot is that you can't get the T3 into the cells without the cortisol. And if you have low adrenals, like or adrenal insufficiency, that this is the cause. And so you need to up your cortisol to get the T3 in, or else it's going to pool. So can you tell me, like Paul's got a, he knows the science on this kind of stuff. He's done a lot of research. So can you just tell me your take on what you've actually discovered in your own research about that? Okay. Um, yeah. Um, well, how does thyroid hormone get into the cells? We need to understand that first. And it gets into the cells because there are um, things in the cell membrane, molecules called transporters. And the thyroid hormone has to get to the cell membrane and then it's transported by the transporter molecules into the cells. There is no research evidence that suggests that in one any way that cortisol has any bearing whatsoever on the transporter molecules. So thyroid hormone gets into the cells very well without cortisol. Obviously, it's not a good thing if cortisol is low because, and the reason for that is that T3 and cortisol are partners, right? The effect of T3 within the cell is improved with the right level of cortisol. The effect of cortisol with this in the cell is improved with the right level of T3. So they work together synergistically. But T3 or T4, not, neither of the thyroid hormones need cortisol to be transported into the cell. They just don't need it. It's just, just and that's not just from research I've read. I've actually gone out and spoke to thyroid researchers about this. I've asked them the question, they said, no, the cortisol doesn't interact with the transporter molecules. So um, there are people that say, um, um, oh, well, your T FT3 looks okay, uh, but you're not feeling well, therefore, the T, the, F, the T3 must be pooling or stuck outside the cell and it's not getting in because there's not enough cortisol. Well, that's just, it, it just can't happen. Mm -hmm. It just doesn't work like that. Um, there are lots of reasons why someone doesn't feel well if their FT3 level looks fine. One is it might not be fine. It might need to be higher. Okay. Right. You know, it might need to be much higher. Um, but also there are other reasons, lots of other things that could be wrong on B12 and iron levels and all kinds of stuff that could be in the way. And what worries me is when someone's FT3 level's okay and someone thinks, says, to, says to another patient, typically says to another patient, your FT3 level's okay, but you're not feeling good, so you probably need more cortisol. So take some hydrocortisone, Cortef. And... Um, that that's like jumping to conclusions that it is the cortisol that's causing the problem and sometimes it isn't now cortisol does have an effect on tsh and uh, when you've got um low cortisol tsh tends to be higher and and that also influences conversion of t4 to t3 so actually you can get more slightly more t3 not a huge amount but slightly more t3 if your cortisol is low but you'd also get more conversion within your cells as well so you probably get more t3 than you had to start with in your cells so it's not actually pooling and sitting outside the cell your, your t3 in the, in the cell is probably higher when you've got low cortisol but it, it's just the t3 is just not working properly if you've got low cortisol you know that they need to be at the right level but my worry is that there's lots of other things that can get in the way. So it needs to be very carefully analyzed to see what's causing a problem when someone has a decent looking FT3 level, but they're not getting well.
Yeah, it, it's in. I really like how you say all the time, it's about how you're feeling, not so much about the lab work. Like in the beginning to identify some problems, it could be good. But I mean, if I was going off my labs, my reverse T3 wasn't out of range. My T3 was over range. My T4 was normal. Like to some, to an endocrinologist, I looked great. I probably, I looked hyper thyroid. <laughs> once said to me that, um, the reference ranges are the side of a barn door. And I said, what do you mean by that? And he said, well, imagine, that, well, we, we know now from research, this brings me, I'm not going to talk about the new book yet, but one of the pieces of research I talk about quite a bit in the new book is that researchers have absolutely proven now that an individual's reference range for FT3 or FT4 is half, less than half the width of the very large population ranges which were assessed by when we have lab tests. So your FT3 range, which you get in a lab test result with your FT3 here, that's a big wide range, but your level might be this big, to be it, to be well, less than half as wide. And that's clear cut research, it's just sat there. That's one of the pieces of research that these guys, endocrinologists and doctors are not taking account of. So lab ranges, the normal reference ranges on your test labs, that and everyone's test labs that they have done are the side of a barn door. And by that I mean, imagine where we have a ball and we've got this huge large barn door in front of us and we throw this thing, right? And it hits the barn door anywhere. Our doctors would say, that's great. Your labs look great. You've hit the side of the barn door. It's in the reference range. Except in reality, we should be drawing a nice tight circle on something that's much less than half as wide as the barn door and hit the circle with it. Now, we don't know what our personal circles are, unfortunately, except they've, they've done that, doing that piece of research, okay? They, they actually worked out what those circles were for individual patients. They, that's why they worked out the ranges for an individual actually less than half as wide. And that took an awful lot of work. But basically, we don't have the, we don't know where our circles are, but we can look at how our response to treatment is and adjust things until our symptoms improve. And then when they're fixed, then we know where we need to be. And that's unfortunately not what happens. It's not what happens. Do you have a recommendation for people on how they, like how you did it? Like in the sense of if someone doesn't have access to a great doctor or functional medicine practitioner, maybe they can't afford one, how to kind of go about getting that, you know, by going on their symptoms um, and, and saying to their doctor, like, could you work with me? <laughs> You're just laughing like, yeah, right. No, not going to happen. <laughs> Well, I've got three books on this. <laughs> you, want yeah. me, you want me to give you the 10 second resume? That would have saved me an awful lot of pages, Karen. <laughs> oh, I know, I know. I think symptoms have been really key. Yeah. Symptoms are really key. But more particularly when, when we can't just, if, we, if someone's on Synthroid, right? They may adjust every single dose possible on Synthroid and it might not work. So we need to have all the treatments op optional. We need to have on the table from doctors, Synthroid T4, T4, T3, natural desiccated, and T3 on its own when the rest don't work. They all need to be on the table. That's one thing. And they're often not on the table for people. So unless they're on the table, I think all bets are off in quite a lot of cases. But then if they're on the table, then the way that someone responds to treatment is key. So symptoms, how do their symptoms improve? Do they improve enough? I personally, within Recovering with T3 book, and, and even when I work with people on NDT or T4, T3 or whatever, I prefer to watch body temperature and how it adjusts, heart rate to make sure the heart rate's okay, blood pressure to make sure that's okay and it, Blood pressure is a symptom, low blood pressure, particularly is a symptom of uh, low cortisol. But also other things can be looked at. A doctor has the ability to do an EKG to check heart out. Uh, you can look at calcium levels to look at 
whether or not you're on too much thyroid hormone. So it's, you know, it's, it's, it's extracting calcium from the bones. We don't want that to happen. But you need to be very, it's a very subtle game. And there isn't, if, I can't give, can't recommend a simple answer because that would mean people would go off, take that answer and go off and do something potentially dangerous. Yeah. Why I've written books on this. Mm-hmm. The Coventry T3 book is primarily about using T3 uh, and not just about the cortisol part of it either, CT3M, that's a minor part of it. Um, so, you know, um, but the, no, I think that that's excellent. And I, and I completely agree. Even if all that you, people get from this is simply to listen to themselves, listen to their body, you know, listen to their intuition and know that if you don't feel well, and even if somebody's saying to you, Hey, your labs look great, you're awesome on this Synthroid and you feel like a bag of garbage, that you need to be proactive and there's so many useful tools. And I tell my clients this all the time that I work with, with thyroid problems is there's so much you can do at home and you have so much control actually in your own hands that you don't even realize, you know, and taking your daily temperature, taking your blood pressure, your heart rate are, could be signs that things aren't where they should be. And you can take that to your doctor, to your functional medicine practitioner and say, okay, my labs might look good, but here's what doesn't look good. Could we maybe, you know, try something else or, and, and really advocate for yourself. I think that that's key that if you think that there's not something right, they don't stop, don't just give up and throw in the towel because you don't understand the science of it. There's simple things um, that you can do. And just starting with getting Paul's book, his newest one, the hand, the, the patient's manual. I, I actually put it on my thyroid. Uh, I have a thyroid, uh, Facebook group and I posted it on there and told everybody like, if you've got thyroid problems, which is all of all 400 people, this is the book you need to get. Like, this is extremely important. Your book and Al Russ's are the two that I, I always recommend the most because you guys, you both have really explained it in a way that, that is really easy to understand. And you both really hit on that uh, reverse T3 issue and how to deal with it. And, and she goes into a lot of the paleo based stuff, which is great, the nutrition stuff. So um, it is a good place to start. So let's just talk about the three books Paul, um, so if somebody is wanting to know more from you, which book would you suggest that? I mean, I think people should get for sure the hand, the the patient manual. But <laughs> yeah, patient manual, I would start with that one. I mean, it's it's, it's something I, I I wasn't planning to write originally. I mean, I, I had this experience with myself with T three, and I knew there wasn't a decent book out there for patients um, uh, about T three. John Lowe had written some great stuff, Doctor John Lowe. But that was like aimed, almost aimed at doctors. It was like his main book was like 1,400 pages long and it was super complicated even for me. So that's not something that's very useful. I wanted to write. So I wrote the T3 book based on my experience because, and also because I knew there was no other book out there on it. So I knew mm-hmm. lots of other people had written books on natural desiccated thyroid and T4 and uh, lots of good books out there. So I hadn't planned to write the new book, The Thyroid Patient's Manual, but um, then I decided to ultimately because I felt lots of the other books out there were not practical enough, didn't cover enough of the, the, the range of topics that need to be covered uh, and didn't cover all the treatments properly. And there's so much new research out there now that I thought I need to bring out. So I would definitely start with The Thyroid Patient's Manual. I mean, if I had my choice now, I'd write that one first. Mm-hmm. Because it's the general one, it's great for people that think they've got a thyroid problem or maybe they've just been diagnosed or they've been on treatment for a few years and it's just not working. Yeah, and, and I like that it's not tunnel vision. You go through each kind of combination, T4, T3, T4, NDT, and T3 only. Yeah, yeah, because there's something out there for everyone. You know, not everyone needs the same treatment, for sure. I mean, mm-hmm. I've never, some people think I just want to push t3 that i'm all about t3 but i only wrote the t3 book recovering with t3 because there wasn't anything out there like that and i thought i was had something useful to add i mean I, I think i've always said that t3 is the treatment of last resort you only get to that when the other ones don't work so i think i would start with the thyroid patient's manual it's a great start and it's 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 unlike 
a lot of the stuff I write, I've written it really simply and really yeah, uh, yeah. simply as I can possibly write it. And it's just chunked full of new research. Mm -hmm. A lot of doctors I'm just absolutely not aware of. Yeah, and you do go into um, like a brief explanation of how to do the CT3M method too, like the that that method. You do go into it, and I think then if or what we've been talking about today, if that's kind of going you know light and some light bulbs off in your head, and you think, hey, I would like to give this a try, you can do that method with NDT, but not Synthroid. Is that correct? Not Synthroid, no. No, um, I didn't think so. That's a big problem, to be honest. One of the problems I I've seen for years now is that. Um, People that have got low cortisol, uh, they're labelled with the term adrenal fatigue, which very much sounds like their adrenals are fatigued. I mean, it's hard to not think that, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Even the new term adrenal insufficiency makes you feel like they're insufficient. <laughs> yeah, I know, but I prefer to call it hypercortisolism these days, low cortisol, because that's what it is. If, it's, if the cortisol's low, it's low cortisol or hypocortisolism, just, just like you've got hypothyroidism. Um, and I might, I might absolutely fervently believe these days that the adrenals don't get fatigued at all. I don't think they do. Um, the, I mean, people that have got Cushing's disease, that have got very, very high Cushing syndrome, very, very high cortisol levels, can have high cortisol for like 10 years, super high. They don't get fatigued. All they need is an ACTH stim simulation from the pituitary and cholesterol, and they just make cortisol. They're really simple, one of the simplest glands in the body. And yes, if they get damaged or they get in an autoimmune condition, and you can get Addison's disease, and then they stop, don't work. But that's really severe. That's very dangerous as well. But most people with low cortisol are termed to have adrenal fatigue, like their adrenals are tired and they need extra help. Most of the time, in my opinion, it's because they're getting low ACTH from the pituitary. So they've got there's some hypothalamic pituitary dysfunction going on. Sometimes that can get corrected using the protocol that I use. Sometimes we never find out what the reason for that problem is. I mean, I think long-term use of antidepressants and uh, anti-anxiety drugs can really mess things up. Mm -hmm. But there's a ton of other reasons for that. High stress for a prolonged period of time can cause low ACTH as well. So um, I think the adrenal fatigue thing is, I just wish that hadn't been coined, to be honest. It's very misleading. I, I, I think so too. I used to say it all the time to clients, oh, you're, you're, you've got adrenal fatigue and they can't pop out the cortisol anymore and that because that's what, everything that I had read. And I remember a couple of years back, I read some research papers and was listening to a functional medicine practitioner, Dr. Brian Walsh. And he is the first person that I heard say, that is not a thing. There's no such thing as adrenal fatigue. He's like, there's been scientific research that people that have gone into the hospital with infections, I, I think it was an E. coli or something strange or some sort of crazy infection that they got rid of, they, they were treated for the infection and when they had the infection, their cortisol levels were extremely low. They treated the infection and a week later, their cortisol went back to normal. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of the time it can be these underlying infections or external stress that are just in our environment, like EMF waves, the artificial lighting, all of these things are considered a stress to your body. Your body just naturally will just down-regulate the cortisol as a self-preservation because they don't, it doesn't, it, it's smart. It doesn't want to stay in this high state of cortisol because that's not healthy for us. Yeah, I agree. There's lots of reasons for it, but I don't believe the adrenals get tired. Um, so yeah, I think it's a shame because um, as soon as someone sees low cortisol, they think they have to stick Cortef into them. Mm -hmm. And I think they'll, Okay, some people may find they cannot find, ever find a solution. It never gets better, and so they have to do it. And I, I can't fault that. That's fine. I think it's rushed into far too quickly. Yes, I believe that it is as well, 100%. So for some people, we'll just be really clear here to wrap it up. There are some of us that it's the fact that the thyroid isn't kicking on at the proper time, early morning hours, and that can help to initiate the cortisol to come up throughout the day. And that can be 
what somebody needs as far as fixing their adrenal fatigue <laughs> or helping out their adrenals, the cortisol levels. It can work that way. It worked. It has worked for many, many people. Yeah, it can do. Yeah. I mean, obviously you need to look at the whole picture. You need to look at the whole nutritional picture as well on the and vitamins and minerals and just look at the whole picture. And it's, it's always best to look at as wide as possible before you try to figure out what's going on. Yeah. Because the body's a really complicated thing. It really is. And it's smart. I always tell people, don't underestimate what your body's doing. It's doing these things for a reason. And it's just best to figure out what that reasoning is before you start slapping on your Synthroid or whatever else it is, right? Well, thank you, Paul. You can find Paul over at recoveringt3.com. We'll have the link in the show notes. And you can buy any one of his three books off of Amazon or any other online bookstore. Um, he's got a Facebook group, Facebook page where he's quite active on with posting from his um, blog that he he's, you're very active on your blog. You're always putting out great content. I always repost it on my, on my Facebook. So <laughs> I appreciate that. But thank you, Paul. I really appreciate everything that you've been able to share with us today. It's great. Thank you, Karen. Appreciate myself. Thank you.